someone, introduce you to someone um, who I haven't really had an opportunity to meet until today. But um, God has used this family in, in churches for a lot of, for a lot of years. Um, there's a, um, he was a pastor in Exeter for a number of years, and that's where um, someone from our church grew up with him as, as, as her pastor. And um, then spent some years in Cambridge, or, sorry, in, um, in London. Took a church through a building program and just brought that church into a place where it's reaching people for the gospel of Jesus Christ in a very powerful way. But I think the, the, the greatest um, testimony of his life is that um, talking to some people, as they describe Kevin, is that he's friendly, sincere. But what really struck me is this person said that, um, that Kevin truly cares about people. He cares about their hearts. He cares about their soul. And he loves Jesus. So Kevin Rutledge, would you please come? Uh, we've been praying for this day. We've been praying that God would give you exactly what we at Emmanuel need to hear. And we want you to know that we are blessed to have you with us today. Thank you. God bless you. Let's welcome him today. Thank you, Kevin. Did you feel it? I felt it. Did you feel it? <laughs> That's good. We have had, uh, we've had kind of an interesting, a long uh, connection with this church uh, through, in one part, a couple of your pastors. In fact, I, I just had lunch yesterday with Pastor Phil Stairs, and uh, Pastor Rick Baker and I go back to uh, childhood. Uh, where we connected in grade eight, doing a project together on creation and evolution, and uh, struck up a lifelong friendship at that point. And so it's just an honor for us to be here and to share with you folks here. Uh, and, and yes, Lauren Medenblick, I was her pastor for 18 years. And uh, so it's neat to see some of these connections again. Um, you know, there are a lot of great familiar stories in the Bible, and I want to read one for you this morning from Luke chapter 9. If you have your Bible, it would turn there. Um, let's, uh, let's go to a, a very familiar old story. Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 10. Uh, Jesus had sent the disciples out on a ministry trip. He'd... Uh, he wanted uh, them to go out and get their hands uh, dirty, if you will, to go out and get some experience in ministry. And as they came back, um, they wanted to, uh, Jesus wanted to get them away uh, to process, to debrief after this. And, um, and here's this famous old story. Let's read it, uh, beginning in verse 10 of Luke chapter 9. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. He took, uh, he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send a crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketful 
of broken pieces that were left over. Anyone who has grown up in Sunday school, I'm sure, has heard this story. Uh, it's a great story. It, it, it's included in all four of the Gospels, which meant it was very significant to the Gospel writers that they include this story. It's a story that would have been told over and over and over again in terms of, of uh, being in an oral culture where they shared stories of Jesus and what he had done. The disciples had come back from this preaching tour. Uh, they, they had been sent out. They had, they wanted, uh, he wanted to, Jesus wanted to get them away for a little retreat after that. We need to discuss what happened when you went out and got some experience. And, and uh, as was often the case, where Jesus was, people were thronging to him. People were looking to him. Uh, they came to him to hear him. They came and brought their sicknesses and diseases and their problems. And, and they were looking to him for help. And, and so what was to be a quiet retreat for them, what was to be just an, uh, a time to get away, became another exhausting day of ministry with thousands of people coming to him. Uh, the day went on. Uh, there was no lunch break. There was no snack. Just the emotionally draining work of helping needy people. It just went on all day long. Healing, preaching, your heart out. And, and the day is getting late, and the sun is starting just to go down a bit, and the disciples say to Jesus, like, let's can this, let's stop it, uh, send the people away, they haven't had anything to eat, and we're tired, and, 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 and uh, we're still here working, let the people go home, they need to eat. And Jesus surprises them by saying, you give them something to eat. You feed them. And you got to think, like, Jesus, are you crazy? You, you see the crowds, there were 5,000 men, plus, plus, plus. Are, are, you, are you out of your mind? You're, you're, selling, you're telling us to go and meet their needs and feed them. And, and this, is, this is impossible. And, and they surveyed what was around. And if you know from one of the other Gospels, Andrew finds a kid who's got a bag lunch that his mom sent him out with that day. He's got five buns and two sardines and i tell you if i were that kid i would be sitting on my lunch and no one would know that i had it but but they find him and they say look at we've looked in terms of food all we have in terms of resources are these five buns and these two little fish and jesus said okay get everybody to sit down in companies of 50 and i think that was probably so they could do it in an orderly way but also so they could do a counting and a reckoning of how many were there. And Jesus takes the bread and he takes the fish and he looks to heaven and he blesses it and he starts distributing it. And the disciples are coming and going and people are being fed and coming and going and everybody is full. Everybody is full. And on top of that, there are 12 basketfuls left over. It's a great story of the power of Jesus that's really familiar to us but what does the story mean what what is christ trying to communicate to us through this story well, well it's about the disciples it's about the disciples it's about the disciples it, and it's they are students in the school of jesus jesus knew that his time on earth was going to be short he was only here for a, a, like a three, three and a half year ministry, uh, public ministry time, and he was going to be gone. But he wanted his work to carry on, and so he needed to train his disciples. And so when he had lots of disciples, but he chose 12 of them and called them to be apostles. They traveled with him. They, they listened to him, and he instructed them. They were students in the school of Jesus, and he was helping to prepare them for service. He was preparing them for when he would be gone and how they would carry on the work of his ministry. So they traveled with him, they helped him, they heard him, they watched him, uh, they were with him night and day, they studied his life, they had private times of teaching and private times of explaining, but you could only do so much by learning that way. And Lauren, being a teacher, you know that sometimes you go through teachers' college. With, but you need to do a practicum, right? You need to go out. If, if you're a mechanic, it's, 
It's not good enough to look at manuals and understand. You've got to get some grease under your fingernails. If you study the piano, you can't study the theory. You've got to get your hands on that and play. And so, so the disciples are sent out for their first practicum. They're going out and, and they're getting a, a, a hands-on taste of ministry. And, and um, Jesus gives them instructions and sends them out. And if you look back to chapter 9 and verse 1, it says this, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Uh, Jesus commissioned his disciples. He, he said, to, you know, I, I am authorizing you to go out in my name and to serve in my name to go out and bring the good news of, of the kingdom in my name, to heal in my name, to cast out demons in my name. Not only did he give them the authority and commission them to go, he gave them the empowerment to do this so that when they come back, like they are blown away. Demons are being cast out. People are being healed. And they're like, they're, they're just awestruck by this. And they come back, and it's supposed to be this time where they get together and tell Jesus what happened, and, and Jesus helps them to, to debrief and understand what was going. But, but Jesus wanted to replicate his ministry in them. Do you notice how they're doing the same things that Jesus was doing? The, he authorized them for that. He empowered them for that. But they had to learn something. They had to learn this, total dependency. They had to learn if in the school of Jesus, if they were going to be successful in ministry, that they would have to be dependent on him. Look at verse 3. It says, it says there, he told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter and stay there until you leave that town. If the people don't welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they went out from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. They had to learn total dependency. And Jesus did something that, I don't know, it just it kind of sounds a little foolhardy to me. It's something that you know, a missions organization would definitely not do today. But to say, all right, I want you to go out and I want you to serve, but no, I don't want you to take anything with you. You don't take a wallet. You don't take money. You only have one change of clothes. You don't take two, two of anything. You go with the bare minimum, with the shirt on your back. And we would say, like, that's, that's crazy. That, that, that's, that's nuts. But what Jesus was helping them to do is see this. The only way you could ever be successful in ministry is if you're totally relying on me. And if you're relying on yourself and what you have, it's not going to happen for you. And so he strips them of everything and sends them out in reliance upon him, only trusting in him. And so they go out with nothing. I think there's a word of instruction to us here. Uh, there's, there's a tendency for us to want to replace trusting God with other things to do his work. There's a tendency for us to be dependent not on God and on prayer, but on clever schemes, on techniques, on programs, on technology, on sociological studies. And we kind of think like if we get the right mix of resources and, and we have the right, the right uh, studies and we have the right program that when those things all come together, we'll be successful in ministry. And we expect them to do what only God can do. I was heartened to hear this morning in the announcements, Mark, that you said we've got a three-day focus on prayer. That's just saying it. God, we can't do your work without you. And that's why we call on you in prayer. That's an expression of dependency upon God. And so, and so uh, here they are having been commissioned and authorized and empowered, they go out to do the work of God on behalf of Jesus. He sends them out with nothing, and they come back with glowing reports of what happened. Now, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes if you have a little bit of success in ministry, it can go to your head, right? Like you're, you're a fairly new Christian, and, and 
and you taught a class and some people said, hey, you did a really good job. And you, you thought you were Billy Graham. You thought like, man, I am good. Um, and, and, and so sometimes a little bit of success can cause us to be a bit self-reliant. And these guys are not done in terms of their preparation. Their preparation is, is ongoing. And so Jesus, Jesus says to them, after all of this good stuff has happened, and after this long, exhausting day of ministry, uh, they say, Lord, send them away. Like, we're starving, and they are too, and they've got to eat. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. You say, Lord, we can't, we can't do that. It's, it's a logistical impossibility there is not enough food we're we're in a remote place you, there, there's not like there's not arby's and burger king and mcdonald's and dairy queen that we can send people away. there's nothing and if we even had money it, we wouldn't have enough money to buy something for them but we wouldn't find a place and jesus said they have a need and you meet that need and so the Jesus who taught them to go out with nothing, with no bread, no money, no luggage, is telling them now, in the school of Jesus, feed them. What they need is help from the master. This is going to be a lesson on dependency. They just returned from successful ministry, but they couldn't do what Jesus was now asking them to do. They couldn't do that by themselves. So they gave to Jesus what they had, and he provided for the needs of the people. They said, oh Lord, all we have is just this little, these few buns and these couple of sardines. And from that, God made for a bountiful provision so that everyone was filled. And in fact, there are 12 basketfuls left over, and my, oh, my, there are 12 disciples. There was enough to take care of their needs and even to provide for them the next day. They needed to learn a lesson that they weren't in this alone, that they couldn't do it alone, that Jesus would have to work, that Jesus would have to do something if they would ever be successful in ministry. And he could do miraculous things with the little that they would offer to him. They were continuing to be prepared to take over Jesus' ministry. To feed hungry souls, not just with physical bread, but with spiritual food. Food for the soul. Healing people, not just physically on the outside, but seeing their person healed from the inside. It's at this point that we discover that this isn't just about the disciples. This story is really about us. You see, we also are disciples. We're followers of Jesus. Like them, we are called to represent Jesus and to continue his work. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, we have these words. And he, that is the Lord, he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are the official representatives of Jesus. He's gone. He left his physical presence he left, but he left his work in our hands as his followers, his disciples. And he wants us to know that this is not just about the apostles, it's about us too. That we are called and that God is making his appeal through us. That we are encouraging and imploring people to be reconciled to God as Jesus' representatives. We are commissioned by God. We're authorized and we're empowered. Look at Matthew 28. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 
I have the authorization, and in fact, I am authorizing you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you, even to the end. We're commissioned, we're authorized, but we're also empowered. Look at Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I will empower you for this. You can't do it without that. I commission you. I authorize you. I empower you to do that work that you're supposed to do. That same power that came and broke in at Pentecost of the Holy Spirit. That same empowerment in which Peter stands up and 3,000 people on one sermon uh, come to follow Jesus Christ. So that a mega church is birthed in one day when the Holy Spirit is unleashed in Peter. You remember Peter? Jesus? I don't know what you're talking about. Don't know the guy. I've never seen him. God did something incredibly wonderful. And in fact, when you begin in the book of Acts, you find this in the very first verse. It says that he's telling us about all that Jesus, in, in his, Luke Acts is one, one, actually one long work, a two-volume work. And, and Luke, when he starts the book of Acts, says this, um, in my first vo volume, Theophilus, I told you all that Jesus began to do and teach. What do you mean began? Because Jesus continues to do and teach through his followers. Oh, he ascended to heaven, but he sent the Holy Spirit to empower them to continue the work of God. And he is still bringing good news to the poor, forgiveness, transformation, healing lives. And he continues to encounter people through his church. And it is a daunting task to continue the work of Jesus. And, and I want you to know that we have an impossible task. Do you know that? Do you know that we have an impossible task? When Jesus said to the disciples, um, he said, you feed them. They're thinking, Lord, are you crazy? It's impossible, we can't do it. You know, Jesus is very happy when we get to the point where we recognize that we can't do it without him. And, and so he says to us, in the same way, feed them. Go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, go and tell people. Go and see their lives healed and see them turned around. See them transformed so that even the complexion of a community can change. Families can change. And they say, well, you know, it's impossible. We, we, we can't do it. And when we get to that place, we're in a very good place when we recognize that we can't do it. That if it's going to happen, it's going to be that Jesus does it. How will people change the whole orientation of their life? Do you know what Christ calls us to? Do you realize how radical that is? That, that, that Christ would be the center of everything we are and have, that he would be the, the, the organizing principle out of which everything in our life flows whether it's our work or our family or our entertainment or, or, or a leisure act, whatever it is, that he is the center of it and everything is done to honor him. I, I mean, to be released from the self-centeredness of our life, to have our morals change and our habits change and our priorities change, to see sinful addictions broken in our life. Those things are miracles that only God can do. We can't do it. How do we then do this work of feeding them, reaching them, loving them, seeing their lives changed? I want to give you just a few points. The first thing I think we do from this passage is to take stock. We have an impossible task. And I think what we need to do is look and see what we do have that Jesus could use. You say, well, look at us. Um, 
we may not have a lot in terms of education or training. Um, the apostles, by the way, didn't either, except they had the training of Jesus. Three and a half year Bible school with Jesus. What do you think that would be worth? We may not have a lot of money, maybe short on abilities, short on giftedness, and we tend to look at what we don't have. And you know what Jesus said to the, to the disciples? What do you have? What do we have? See, survey. What resources do we have? Well, there's a kid here with a little lunch of five buns and two fish. That's all we have. I can't do anything with that. Give it to me. Take stock in terms of what you have. And let me ask you this question. What do you have? What do you have that you could dedicate to Jesus? What has God given to you? And when you think about that, all of us, or maybe a lot of us, would, would, would say, well, all right, I'm, I'll take stock. What do I have? I, I, I suppose I have, and then put a butt after that. I mean, I love kids, but what good is that? I, I have a van. Um, I'm good at organizing. We have a nice home with a huge family room. I can repair cars. I'm handy. I'm a great cook. I can sew. I can do electrical work. I can coach soccer. I can play guitar. I'm a teacher. Uh, I do taxes and finances. I'm old and physically I can't do much anything more, but I love to pray. I'm good at talking to people. What do you have? Take stock of what you have. And, and, and when you do that, don't make an excuse and say, but, but it's only this. And then secondly, offer to Jesus what you have. You say, well, it isn't very much. It's, it's just like two sardines and five buns. What can you do with that? Give it to Jesus. Do you know why Jesus, do you know why Jesus loves this? Because when Jesus does something like feed the 5,000 with a couple fish and five buns, nobody gets the credit except him. Do you know that Jesus wants the credit? He wants the honor. He wants the glory. And that's why, that's why he loves to work with people who don't have a lot. In terms of, hey, look at me. You know, I, oh, Lord, you're so, you're so blessed to have me with all of my gifts and all my abilities. The Lord says, I, I, don't, you know, I don't need that. Because you can't do anything without me. If I don't do it, it doesn't get done. People's lives don't change because you're a gifted person. They change because I do something through what you offer to me. And he delights to do that. He delights to take little things that you have and to use that for his own purpose because you realize you can't do it alone. And the third thing is do it with Jesus. They're working with Jesus. And when you offer and put into the master's hands the little you have, he can do incredible things with that. What can a child do? Child. Child can't do anything. A little girl in, in our church by the name of Danae. And Danae um, had a little friend called Brianne. Brianna. And and. They played, and she said to Brianna, would you like to come to church with me? And Brianna said, yeah, I, I would like that. It happened to be Mother's Day. And so Brianna's mom thought if on Mother's Day her child is going to church, maybe it would be a good, ge nice gesture on her part to go to church also. And so she came to church also. After the service, as her mom was going out, she shook my hand, and, and she said, um, inspiring message, Reverend, thank you. And she came back the next week. And after about two more weeks, she said, I would like to speak with you. Can I make, can I make uh, an appointment to come and talk to you? I said, sure. We set up a time. 
And on the appointed time, she came into my office and she bought, brought a, a stack of paper about so high and she sat it on my desk. And she said, this is my life. Uh, she was a professor at the university. And these were all her, uh, her uh, published articles and, and uh, papers that she had done. And she said, this is my life. And we began to talk uh, about what what her life meant and, and what her needs were. And, and, and in, the, in the throes of this conversation, she said, um, she came to the conclusion, which I never said, that she wasn't a Christian. I didn't say that. I'm just telling her and letting her evaluate her life. And she went away thinking because she'd always kind of thought of herself. She went to church as a kid. And, uh, and, and so she came back and, and, uh, to church the next week. And the next week, and then God did something, and he turned on the light. And after service, uh, that Sunday, she stayed in her seat, and everybody left. And I went, and I, uh, I sat down, and, and I said, uh, what's up? She said, can I talk with you? And God had opened her heart and prepared her. And she became a follower of Jesus at that moment. What can a little kid do? What can a 10-year-old kid do? She can, make a, she can make a connection so that a university professor can come to faith in Jesus Christ. i never forget the next Sunday that her mom came out. She came and was just beaming. She said, you won't believe I've been reading my Bible. I've read the Bible a tiny bit in my life, but the words were jumping off, my, off the page at me. God had changed her heart and her life. It was a miracle. But it started with a little kid. What do you have to offer to Jesus? To do something with Jesus? Uh, I want to put a picture up on the screen for you. Uh, this man's name is Philip Johnson. Uh, you may not know him. Uh, probably most of you would not. He grew up... Uh, I went to Sunday school a little bit as a kid in Aurora, Illinois, just outside of uh, Chicago, in what he would call a secular home. He studied law and uh, offered, was offered a position at Harvard, but, offered, uh, but rather took a position at University of Cal uh, California, Berkeley campus, at teaching criminal law. He, des he, he describes himself as a perfectly ordinary, middle-of-the-road, secular rationalist. He was bored with life, bored with his work, found his academic uh, career uninspiring and shallow, considered himself a nominal agnostic and very unfulfilled in life. His wife left him and their children to pursue a career in artistic politics. I don't even know what that is. And he was left alone to raise his children. He needed some help, and uh, a local church in their neighborhood uh, was having what we would call a daily vacation Bible school. Mark, you were making an appeal for people to sign up and help. Go and sign up and help, Mark, will you? Um, anyway, he thought he would send them to this program. And they went for the week. Do you know what happens so often at the end of these? Uh, you have like a wrap-up program and you bring the parents in on a Friday night or something like that. And, and so here is this great legal mind. And he's in there. And the pastor of the church closes off their program with a very simple gospel presentation aimed at the hearts of the kids and certainly their parents also. And something happened. God did a miracle in that man's life. In the closing program for DVBS, all the little kids and this great legal mind got open to his grace. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. And he applied his not so insignificant intellect to forward the work of God in the university. He wrote a, a number of books uh, and started a whole movement 
uh, called intelligent, the intelligent design movement, the whole creation debate. And uh, he wrote books that uh, from a legal stand, from a lawyer arguing a case, would make a case for intelligent design or a creator, God. And uh, you, can, you can get a number of, of his books. But it was a DVBS program. It, it was nothing. It was a simple little thing. It was a simple little presentation that certainly wouldn't speak to a man of this kind of intellect. But God delights to do that. He delights if we will give him the little that we have and put it in his hand and in dependency upon him, seek to do his work. And he can change lives in a very radical way. There was a little boy named Howie. His parents had split up. He had been with his uh, grandparents. And he went, um, he went to, in a neighborhood, uh, he, he didn't really go to church or anything. And there was a man in a church in that neighborhood who had a desire to be a Sunday school teacher, Mark. And he went and he said, um, could I be a Sunday school teacher? This guy didn't have a lot of education at all. And they said, well, like, we really don't have a class for you, but if you can go out and get a, a group of kids, you can have your own class. So this man went out, and he started playing marbles with the kids, grade five, grade six, in that, in that age group. And he got about nine kids interested and started his Sunday school class. Of those nine kids, I think, I think it was about seven of them went on to vocational Christian ministry. And one of them, this little boy Howie from a broken home, would go on to make a very significant mark for Christ. He became Howard Hendricks, the distinguished professor of Christian education at Dallas Theological Seminary, who has made a significant mark around the world, not just the thousands of uh, students that he's taught over the years, but that his ministry through them and through his writing ministry has gone all around the globe. But it started with a man who didn't have much of any education, just a heart to do something for God, and a man who started playing marbles with kids. And he touched hundreds of thousands of lives through that. See, God has given us an impossible task. And he's saying, would you take stock of what you have? And would you give it to me? And would you allow me, in dependency upon me, to take that and do some incredible things and see some miraculous stuff done? See, he's given us an impossible task, but he delights to do it. God delights to do wonderful things through us. What do you have that you can give to God that seems really insignificant to you? What do you have as a church collectively as you take stock of the, the gifts and abilities and resources that God has given you to change the face of Chatham? Where family by person by person and family by family are touched by the power of of the gospel as Christ has us in his school preparing us that we would continue his incredible work of touching lives. May God bless you as you're faithful in that. Father, thank you so much for this simple little story that is so profound and that shares something of your heart and love and compassion for people. There's something, Lord, that that, that so wonderfully you do through our feeble efforts to really change lives. And Father, I just pray for this dear people, for this church, that individually they will be asking, Lord, what have you given that I can use for you? 
and for this church that you would powerfully use them to touch the lives and the hearts of people just because you can. Through our humble efforts, we give them to you in Christ's name. Amen.